This video contains discussions of intersexual and transgender identity, and the bigotry against LGBTQIA plus folks. If you don't want to engage with those topics, that's great. You know what you need, and I do not. Have a good day. I'm N. Kyridian Green. Today, well, today I expect you to figure out what I'm like. I'm, I'm giving you clues, because this is the philosophy corner. In the pantheon of ancient philosophers, there are those who set the stage and those who stole the show. Sure. Socrates invented the concept of virtue, and he sort of basically founded Western philosophy as we know it. Confucius kind of developed a universal system of human morality, without having to appeal to deities or magic of any kind. That's, that, that's pretty impressive. I just, I've always been much more drawn to the like, marginal and misunderstood, the quirky and the queer. This is one such tale. In 399 BCE, Socrates was executed for not being good enough at the thing he pretty much invented, which was, again, the concept of being good enough. For his crime of sophistry, the city of Athens made him drink hemlock tea, a deadly poison. About 500 years later, the city of Corinth formed a mob and tore down a statue. When the statue's subject heard this news, he said, well, I mean, if only Socrates had thought to have a statue, it might have spared him the hemlock. This was Favorinus. Sources are unfortunately silent on whether or not he immediately put on sunglasses and skateboarded away, but they definitely don't say that he didn't do that. Favorinus was a magnet for paradox his entire life. He was a Roman, intersex, transgender philosopher who, who wasn't Roman or trans or a philosopher. A many-turning man, famous as a great public speaker and formidable debater. Philostratus said he was able to get attention and woo crowds who didn't even speak Greek. They were just charmed by by the sound of his voice, the significance of his glance, and the rhythm of his tongue. Oof, that's a powerful gay compliment. One of his secrets was how bombastic and animated he was. I imagine a debate with some boring, by-the-book spirit boy, and an opponent who's leaping around the stage, doing character voices, and making elaborate sound effects with his mouth. We're talking absolute S-tier TikTok behavior here. And not only that, but Favorinus wrote a whole bunch of real bangers in his life, although none of these survive. We have commentaries instead, things that were written about him, and more than one satirical play written by one of his haters. The one piece of his writing that does survive is his address to the Corinthians, a speech he gave after the Corinthians tore down that statue of his. We're going to circle back to it. Favorinus said his life contained three paradoxes. He was a Gaul who spoke Greek, a eunuch tried for adultery, and someone who argued with an emperor but lived. A quick clarification here, Favorinus was a congenital eunuch. He was born without testicles not operated on. He presents these three paradoxes as a sort of summary of himself. I will be following suit and trying to share his story in three parts, one about each paradox. The first paradox is about his nationality. Ethnically, he was a Celtic Gaul from Arles in modern-day France. It's in the Rhoyne Valley, once part of the Greek world, the ancient Mediterranean. But like all civilizations, it was a cosmopolitan place, home to many people. About 50 years before Favorinus was born, his region was invaded and vassalized by Roman armies, meaning that he grew up somewhere that was very recently Roman. His household might have spoken some mixture of Latin, Celtic, and Greek. Now, out of those, he was clearly most fond of the Greek language. It was the thing he tried to master. This is important because philosophers were expected to defend their arguments by reciting memorized passages from great writers like Homer and Sappho and Plato. Debates could turn entirely on the meaning of a particular word. So much so that Favorinus almost died over a semantic disagreement, but we're going to get to that in Paradox 3. Many contemporaries refused to accept him as a legitimate Roman. He had learned how to be that way. To them, you had to be born into it. It reminds me of this old crusty dude who was always at town meeting. Um, in Vermont, lots of towns have these local meetings in place. Town meeting is an exceedingly dull form of civil service, and I was very nearly always the youngest person in attendance. I don't know how many people are familiar with this concept. Anyway, there was this one dude who was always looking out for newcomers. If someone voted or spoke up that he didn't recognize, he'd call a point of order and demand they prove they were locals. Technically, at this point, all you had to be was a registered voter. If you said that, everyone but Krusty would move on. And Krusty did not like that. According to him, there were locals, and then there were flatlanders. And it just didn't matter how good your cider was, you're still a flatlander unless your grandparents grew up in Vermont. Do I need to go into why this is all nonsense? Am I from America or am I from Vermont? Was Favorinus a Gaul or a Roman? The answer is yes. But I digress. Now, we're getting into the good stuff here. And by that I mean the complicated stuff. Um, there are some unsolvable problems that get in the way when you want to talk about historical identity in modern terms. I'm not going to do the topic justice today. I started this video so I could upload without rushing my next project. I've done my best, 
but I'm simply not going to cover this better than adequately. And check the description for links to resources on these topics. And do let me know if you'd be interested in a more focused video just about researching queer history. Let's start with the stuff that everyone agrees on. Favorinus was an intersex man. His word was unakos, eunuch. Um, there are examples of people using this word as pretty neutral and just descriptive. It seems to be somewhat respectful to the language that existed at the time. Now, we know a surprising amount about Favorinus's genitals. Well, okay, so unfortunately surprising isn't the right word. It's weird, but not surprising. There have always been weirdos who are obsessed with this stuff. I don't really see a reason to get into it aside from how he sees himself. And surprisingly, we have some record of how he felt about his body and his gender. And that's honestly worth celebrating on its own. Gay history is everywhere, obviously, but prudes have done their level best to acknowledge it as little as possible, and they will often actively suppress it. My favorite of many, many examples is this guy Kirk Hylas of Andros, the imaginary husband of one Sappho of Lesbos. Yes, the namesake of both Sapphic and lesbian. So this guy, Kirk Hylas, his name smoothly translates to Dick Johnson from Man Island. Actually, I'm giving him uh, too much credit. Kirk Hylas isn't a name, and Andros just means man. Some guy was so mad that Sappho was gay that he made up a husband for her and named him Penis of Man. I have literally seen people citing this source this year as part of an ongoing effort to just generally censor gays out of the historical record. But I digress. Favorin is presented as a man, viewed himself that way, and lived a life that was distinctly purposefully masculine. Remember those satirical plays I mentioned? One of them ends like this. You're not educated, you're not clever, and you don't have any experience in this subject. Honestly, what qualification do you have to practice philosophy at all? Orcus. Balls. That one-liner, by the way, is supposed to end Favorinus's career. It's the best dunk the author could think of, poor thing. Later in life, Favorinus was put on trial as an adulterer. In a twist that proves magic is real, the jury found him innocent on the grounds that only men can commit adultery. People had been trying to adjudicate his gender for years. One group painted him as a sexual criminal, the other attacked the realities of his body, but they just ended up cock-blocking each other. It's poetry. Mwah. The question doesn't need to be asked at this point, am I overstepping by calling him trans? I mean, we know for a fact that he didn't see himself that way. It's just a very modern label. And the fact that Favorinus's gender was literally debated in a court of law is pretty definitively trans, but there are a bunch more layers to this Kokakia. For one, it's often assumed that intersex people are trans by default, and this is wrong. Intersex people are like everyone else, so most of them are raised as either men or women. When socialization aligns with gender, you're cis. Gender isn't about your body. Indeed, the most grounded perspective on Favorinus is probably that he was cis. He was, he was AMAB, since he was tutored well enough to join a philosophical academy, and neither would have been really cool if he wasn't a dude. However, he was not accepted for his gender because of his body. He endured ridicule and debate and criticism during his life and for centuries since. In that way, I personally feel that trans applies. This logic wouldn't hold for someone today, but history requires storytelling. The past is a foreign country. It has to be translated. Which leads to this final wrinkle. The moment you translate, you are influencing your audience to a particular perspective. My standards for what counts as transgender are distinctly modern, and it's important to be specific here. For example, people often say that the Romans and the Greeks were gay. Even scholars end up making really weird generalizations because of this. Now, today, we'd obviously call two dudes kissing an extremely cool and gay thing. Romans would not have understood this. Gender just plays a very different role in the Roman conception of sexuality. To be clear, Roman dudes did so many things to one another, and they had just as many weirdos with made-up rules about who you should be allowed to kiss. It just wasn't really about gender. In their episode on Hadrian, the exquisite hosts of the Queer as Fact podcast said this. This idea of exclusively same-gender attracted men gathering together in social groups based on that identity in the Roman court just isn't something we have evidence for, and Romans were more likely to conflate being notorious in your pursuit of women, as Morwood had said, with also behaving similarly towards men. Both were seen as lacking self-control and acting on your attractions with too much freedom, rather than being specifically defined by what gender you might be expressing those attractions mm -hmm. towards. So, like, if we have the Kinsey scale that goes from, like, super straight to super gay, then they just have, like, none horny to too horny. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a very good summary of Roman sexuality. I mean, what being gay means to someone can change after watching a particularly good cartoon. Do you think that I, I cuff my pant legs because my legs are different? 
that they got different from kissing boys. Nah, sexuality and gender are just fluid concepts. Get over yourself. Trans people have always existed, even if we weren't called that. And an inclusive queer history can't just shrug and say being gay is a social construct. I mean, it is, but so are nationalities and races and families and money and governments and history. Yet most historians will engage with those topics. My point is that Favorinus was trans according to contemporary standards. We know for a fact that he considered himself a man, but others did not. It is transgenus. It's a flawed label, and one that hopefully I've done justice to. Today, sophistry means a dishonest argument, either a point that sounds kind of valid, but is ultimately specious, or something that a liar makes up on purpose, because that's the thing they like. In the ancient world, it was also a bad thing, but it's sort of a very different bad thing, and some people thought it was a good thing. Uh, sophistry wasn't a school of philosophy, but an alternative to it. See, because in the ancient world, a philosopher was a much more specific thing. It wasn't just an academic. They had to study the universe and learn cool things. Of course, they needed to be educated by someone, of course. And generally, that person had to already be a successful philosopher. Eventually, they'd go on to teach others. And this education always had to be free. Philosophers had to debate honestly and openly. They had to act piously as role models. And they needed to be big old beefcakes. Just slabs of thick, hunky beach body twerking and talking. Academies were full of twonks and daddies. Everywhere you look, all wrestling and having formal debates about the essence of truth. Plato was a nickname. It means broad. Either his chest or his shoulders, because he was swole as hell. And naked wrestling was not an elective at his school. Literally, what was I talking about? Right, sophistry. Here's a brief anachronistic explanation. Sophists treat education as a trade. Um, they expect to be paid for their work. They focused on rhetoric, on how a point is argued, not just on what the substance of the point is. It's not that this point doesn't matter. Philosophers just believe that only truth mattered, while sophists believe that the truth and how persuasively it was shared both mattered. They believe that truth was often or always relative. If you're like me, those are pretty innocuous positions. I wanted to kind of go into explaining why these were seen as evil, but it's eye-wateringly complex. And I'm tired, and I did a half-decent job with the gender stuff. This video is supposed to be easy. Look, please just trust me. Sophists weren't saying anything that wild, but it was a radical thing to do. May I remind you how Socrates died. Which finally brings us to the time that Favorinus almost died over the definition of a word. Hadrian, the Roman emperor at the height of the Roman Empire's power, was wrong about a word. We don't know which one, but everyone kind of agrees that Favorinus was right and the emperor was wrong, which makes this a classic dilemma. See, he could correct the emperor and virtuously pursue the truth above anything else, or he could let an innocuous mistake slide. See, so there's nothing to, like, gain, really, and everything to lose, because the emperor is allowed to execute you for being rude. Heck, St. Nicholas was actually imprisoned at one point because he got into a fist fight with someone else in front of the emperor. Oh, God, I gotta talk about St. Nicholas at some point. Did you know he was a demon hunter? But I digress. Our boy declined to argue with the Master of Thirty Legions. This choice was seen as cowardly by the debate bros and disrespectful by the bootlickers. To Feverinus, it was an act of defiance, not deference. He was right, and he knew it, but he didn't need to prove it. Someone said cake or death, and he was like, cake, bitch. You might not be impressed by that, but a good philosopher is supposed to choose death. May I remind you how Socrates died? The fallout from this argument with Hadrian was far-reaching. Our boy would eventually be exiled for it, maybe. Uh, evidence is actually not conclusive. It might have also been the reason that Corinth tore down that statue, which led to the address, the only surviving piece of Favorinus's writing. His big speech shows off a lot of rhetorical flourish. He gives the Corinthians backhanded compliments just to mess with them, satirizes his peers, and generally makes a big fuss. At one point, he begins to play his own statue in a mock trial. I like to imagine that he is sort of jumping onto and off of the plinth every time he switched characters. And this is where Favorinus lays out his personal philosophy of identity, contrary to what he's been told his entire life, and what you've probably been told as well. Identity is just not about your body, or your place of birth, or really anything outside of your control. Oops, Editor Green here. I didn't mean to imply that identity is never connected to your body or origins, only that it does not have to be in order to be legit. Many things like race, disabilities, and culture innately belong to certain people. Favorinus mastered Greek because he chose to, not because he was born somewhere that speaks Greek. He was a man because he willed it, not because somebody looked at his body and decided for him. He didn't have sex to father children, but because he wanted to get nasty. If he wished, he could argue with the emperor, or anyone else. If not, he would not. In fact, to him, these truths were actually more true. Working for them and fighting for them, that made them more valid, not less. They were real precisely because they were the product of his choices. He is himself 
as an end in itself. And there he was, a Gaulish Roman who lived like a Greek, standing in a Romanized Corinth, which had been a Greek city for centuries. I'd like to share some of his words at this point, but I'm worried because they're sort of in third person and they're allegorical poetry translated from a dead language. I've spent some time with this passage and the commentaries on it. I think the voice is very clear, but I can't really fault someone for feeling otherwise. I should probably go into it, you know, try to give you some basic groundwork so that you can understand. (laughs) For of the Greeks, it is possible to see their best over there, inclining toward Roman things. But the Guardian inclines toward Greek things. And on account of this, he relinquishes his property and political position and absolutely everything, so that there might be left to him one thing instead of all else, to seem and to be Greek. So then, should this man not be erected before you in bronze? Yes, and in every city. Before you, on the one hand, because as a Roman, he adopted the Greek way of life, as did your city. Before the Athenians, because of how he speaks. Before the Spartans, because... Of how he exercises, and before everyone else, because he philosophizes, and he's just already persuaded so many Greeks to philosophize with him. A good Roman citizen was thought to stand with good posture, an upright citizen. That's where we get that idea. <clears throat> to the Romans, upright posture was itself a manly thing, was the sign of a man. A beloved statue, too, stands upright, because a hated statue is torn down. So Favorinus makes himself upright, he makes himself into himself. And furthermore, if the city is determined to destroy his likeness, he'll just make a new one, a new one they can't tear down. I, ere now forgetfulness, hath tripped and cheated sundry others too, but judgment plays no tricks on any man of worth, and tis because of this that you stand upright from me like a man. At that final word, Favorinus motions to an accomplice off stage who pulls away a cloth and reveals a new, even bigger statue of himself. Maybe. Uh, Scholars actually seem to think that this new statue is a rhetorical flourish. It's a metaphor. Favorinus is invoking his words to create a statue that can't be torn down, not by earthquake or wind or snow or rain, envy or foe, but lo. While that is a lovely thought, it's just not as funny as if there was a real hidden statue off stage the entire time. Thanks to my patrons, Not Nets, Ryan, Sam, and Audrey. I only have the four of you right now, so I guess your names get to be really big.